And I used to think that my church had let me down, the church that I went to growing up, had let me down and had not communicated the gospel. Either had not communicated it at all or not well enough. And in recent years, I've come to realize maybe it wasn't my church. Maybe it was me. Maybe it was me just not getting it. Um, I think it's wrong to um, pin all the blame there as I think back about the different people that had input into my life. I can't find fault there. They were, they were sharing what they knew to share. They were sharing the way that they knew to share. And if I didn't get it, it's not necessarily their fault. I'm also coming to realize that while my initial surrender took place on a day, this coming to know the Lord thing is such a progression. A time of, of knowing first that God exists, and then a time of knowing that He did something with His Son on the cross. A time of knowing that you got to do something about that. You've got to make a decision. And for some people, it's a, it's a one moment I did trust Christ, or one moment I didn't trust Christ, the next moment I was trusting Christ. And for other people, it's I don't remember when I started trusting Christ. And I think that's the coolest thing. And I didn't live a life of rebellion um, and, and, and willful sin. In fact, when my sister invited me to that revival, she thought that I already was a Christian. Um, but even though I didn't have the extreme experiences of some that didn't make me any less lost or any less in need, um, didn't make those night times without Christ any easier. Um, and once I got to Francis Marion as a believer, thank you, Lord, and got involved with a group of people who were more excited about belonging to Jesus than where they had gone to high school or what they were majoring in or what they were going to do uh, the next day, I began to grow and grow and grow and different folks would share their testimonies. And there's nothing more fun to me than hearing how people have come to trust Christ and to find out what he did to draw them in. And one guy shared about his life of, of drug use and alcohol abuse and difficult choices and horrible consequences. And I sat there in the crowd thinking, well, that's wow, that's amazing. Um, I didn't do any of that. So my story might not be so entertaining, um, so, so challenging, might not draw so many people in. And it was as though he was uh, reading my thoughts because in the next couple of sentences, he, he looked around at the group of us and said, I wish that my testimony was not what it is. I wish that the way the Lord got me was void of all those difficult circumstances. I wish that I could have come to him without having to learn things the way that I did. And it really reminded me that these stories <laughs> of how we come to know the Lord, they're not our stories. It's not my story. It wasn't his story. It's, the, it's God's story. He's the one that did it. Thank him. Thank you, Lord, that he holds us and doesn't let us go. Because my next fear was, well, what if I fail? What if I'm not so good at being a Christian? What if I don't do it right? And what if I mess up and, and I'm not a Christian anymore? The Lord gave me the assurance that I went, it was to go beyond my feelings. The fact was that whoever has heard God's word and believes in him who sent Jesus Christ has eternal life and is no longer condemned. He's crossed from death to life. It's end of story. And it didn't matter what I felt. And the person who shared that verse from John 5:24 with me gave me what I needed to stand secure. Should I happen to let go of him, he wouldn't let go of me. Again, I just needed to know that this was all his idea. And it wasn't my idea. It wasn't my doing. Um, God made it plain to me. He would hold me and nothing would let me slip out of his hand. Not even myself. Um, which brings me to the point at which I met the love of my life, Greg Stuckey. Uh, I met Greg and we knew pretty quickly, probably within about three months of when we officially started dating, um, that this was a relationship unlike others and that we needed to be considering uh, marriage. But this was a very frightening thought for me. I didn't know what my assurance was that I wouldn't follow the same path um, of divorce as had already been followed in my family. And what assurance did I have that I wouldn't one day uh, de decide that I needed a divorce. And I couldn't tell Greg that I would marry him and he wouldn't ask me to marry him until he knew I would say yes, and I couldn't tell him yes um, because I couldn't guarantee that my feelings 
wouldn't change. Um, being assured in my heart that uh, I was, I'm very human and that feelings do change <laughs> on a regular basis. And as I've said, my emotions change daily and, and the Lord knows he, he, I'm an emotional person and he's grown me so much in learning how not to let my emotions be what's in charge of me. So Greg and I were at the point where we needed to know, were we gonna keep on moving towards marriage or were we not? So I took my first mission trip to uh, Peru, South America. And the whole goal, two goals really, goal number one, of course, to obey the Lord, to find out what his plan for me might be in the way of missions and ministry, but also to take that time to pray fervently and devotedly Lord, is it your will for me to marry Greg or not? And smack in the middle of that summer, right about the time Philippe Lang was about this tall and uh, told his mom, Mommy, we need to pray for Mr. Greg and Miss Jamie because Kirk and Marion had spent so much time with us and so much time encouraging us and counseling us, uh, they and Walt and Joe Russ and several other um, people that I just love and admire and, and thank the Lord for at Sandhurst. Anyway, Philippe said, Mommy, we need to pray for Mr. Greg and Miss Jamie. And it was right in the middle of that summer trip and right at that time in South America, my team leader, my assistant team leader said to me, Jamie, do you know anything yet? Because everybody knew I was praying about that. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, I do. And I realized God had, had opened my eyes at that time and realized that God had shown me everything I needed to know. And he made me know that my relationship with Greg, our marriage would be based on God who never changes, not on my feelings or on Greg's feelings or on anything under the control of humans, which is really very little. And from that moment on, I was rock steady. Please don't ask Greg how many times um, I broke up with him while we were dating. Um, and if you do, make sure you have me nearby so I can tell my side of the story. But at any rate, when I came back from Peru, I was able to tell Greg that if he would ask me to marry him, I would say yes. And it was very tricky. How do you tell a guy this without actually proposing to him when you're the girl? Um, but we managed and then he made me wait two weeks. I made him wait 10 months. He made me wait two weeks before he asked me to marry him. We got married in September of 1990. Um, and in 1994, we moved to Belize, Central America. And the joy of serving the Lord, regardless of where he puts me, puts us, is unspeakable. Obedience brings such a beautiful peace and a closeness with the Lord. And I've had the joy of being able to walk with the Lord and walk with my husband walking with the Lord. Greg and I lived in Belize for about five years, um, from 94 till 98. We go back and forth to Belize pretty regularly, taking teams from Sandhurst and other places to do short-term missions there. Um, after we finished with our time in Belize doing youth work there, we began working with uh, Envoy International and then eventually Amazon Focus, working with tribal believers in the Amazon region. We finished that work. Greg is now the pastor of missions. Missions is very close to our hearts. And we have two daughters, Jordan Lee, who's almost 13, and Callie, who is eight. And they go with us each time that it's feasible uh, for them to go with us, we take them so that they can see what the Lord is doing in other places around the world, so that they can know that there's more out there than just what we have here in Florence, which is wonderful. Florence is a beautiful place, but how sweet to be able to let our children know that there are people everywhere who need the Lord and that the Lord is doing amazing things in so many other places. Greg and I have been married now for 18 years. He's still my favorite person to hang out with. I still thank the Lord on a daily basis for him. I look forward to seeing where the Lord takes us and what He does. And the peace that Lord, the Lord has given me on a daily basis for living, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And I love to tell the story of what God did. And I think it's so funny that in those early days, I was so shy and so afraid to come to people and say, do you know where you're gonna go when you die? And yet the Lord called us into missions and it's so close to our hearts. And missions is all about making sure that people know where they're gonna go when they die. But um, how beautiful is it that there are so many different ways to talk about it, and so many different ways to handle it, and so many different ways to share the Lord. And there's nothing better than sharing the Lord.